r slash no sleep posted by you slash mac moyer author when we were kids my little brother died on halloween he's come back to visit me every year since his death jimmy returned for the first time exactly one year after the accident i was home alone dad was at the bar and mom was dead we'd crammed her into a pine box and shipped her off to the incinerator months ago I'd been sitting on the couch watching a plump cockroach scuttle across the coffee table, sipping whiskey that I'd liberated the previous night after Dad passed out. I wasn't quite drunk yet. At 11 years old, my tolerance to alcohol was comparable to most local stumblebum drunks. A knock came to the door, the gentle tap of brittle knuckles upon rod and wood. I paused with the rim of the bottle resting against my lips. Even the cockroach cocked its long antennae curiously toward the door. The local trick-or-treaters knew better than to come here seeking candy. Our ramshackle abode was always one DHS visit away from being condemned, and the cobwebs and sundry creepy crawlies in our front windows certainly weren't decorative. I reflexively choked out a sob when I opened the door and saw his ghostly form. The sheet draped over him was stained brown and soaked with stinking river water. Jimmy? I asked, my voice croaking in disbelief. As if to answer me. His jaw fell slack and I heard the tiniest groan emerge from under that sheet, like a whining door hinge in a quiet house. He raised his hand to me and I shrank back in fear, expecting him to thrust an accusatory finger and damn me as a liar and murderer. Instead, I realized that he was holding his hand open, expecting something. A dry, throaty sound whistled up from his slackened jaw and I suddenly understood what he wanted. My little brother had come back for his favorite holiday. I rushed up to my bedroom, reached under my bed and grabbed Jimmy's pumpkin-shaped Halloween bucket. I flipped off the roaches and shook out mouse shit then ran back to the front steps, where my little brother was waiting. As Jimmy snatched his candy bucket from me, I saw them, watching us from the corner. It was the same group of older bullies that harassed us last year, on the night of the accident. Last time, they'd been wearing clown masks. They chose the Power Rangers this year. Despite their masks, I could tell that those bullies didn't quite believe what they were seeing. Jimmy had been presumed dead for a year, yet here he was, wearing the very same costume they'd seen him wearing on the night he went missing. I'd had a growth spurt since that night. Rage and self-hatred did wonders for a growing boy's physique. Fueled by whiskey and a desperate urge to blame anyone other than myself for Jimmy's death, I charged them. Outnumbered four to one, I took some shots, no doubt, but I routed them regardless, and I left one of them bleeding on the sidewalk, beaten nearly half to death. Then I returned to Jimmy, smiling, and hooked my pinky around his before we set off to celebrate Halloween. I sat on my couch, eyes trained on the flickering candle on my coffee table. The power had been out for a month and I hadn't seen any good reason to turn it back on, I'd only be cutting into my meager booze budget and, besides, the city was kicking me out in a few days. The house had been bought and paid for by some long dead relative then passed down to my parents as an act of pity. When dad finally kicked the bucket, he left the house to me but I was never quite able to stay ahead of the property taxes. I wasn't going to miss the place. It wasn't exactly full of fond memories. At this time of night, I'd normally be blackout drunk, but tonight was Halloween and I didn't want to miss Jimmy. My entire life might have amounted to a hill of shit, but I've promised to never let my little brother down again. I checked the time. 8 o'clock on the dot. I grabbed Jimmy's Halloween bucket and headed out front. Jimmy never did tell me why Halloween was his favorite holiday. He'd been a gentle kid, small for his age, fair-skinned and wispy. You wouldn't have known it to look at him, but he preferred the schlock and gore of October Grindhouse horror movie marathons to Kitty Fair more appropriate to his age. He never flinched at the scary parts, when the reanimated undead wreaked havoc or dream demons emerged to slash open teenage throats. I'd never attributed his love of Halloween to something so cliché as donning a mask to pretend to be someone else, though I wouldn't have blamed him. No. I'd always suspected that Jimmy loved this time of year specifically because it was when the world went dim and happily embraced the horrific. Vampires and possessed dolls and werewolves made more sense than the more abstract horrors we faced at home. Or, shit, maybe the kid just really liked candy. I stepped outside and the riverwards were alive with grinning jack-o'-lanterns, windows glowing orange and framed with fake spiderwebs, and scores of yuppie parents leading their kids door to door. I spotted him walking slowly toward the house. I swore. He got smaller every year. I waved to him. He didn't wave back, but he did cock his head slightly, as if he was struggling to remember who I was. As always, he was wearing the filthy sheet, soaked in river water. 
I felt a passing wave of revulsion and guilt when I glimpsed the faded bloodstains where the fabric hugged Jimmy's misshapen occipital. I smiled and offered him the bucket. Jimmy snatched it from my hand. Though there was only darkness within those crooked eye holes I'd cut into the sheet 25 years ago, somehow I knew that if he still had eyes, they'd have been gleaming. I reached down to his hand, hooked my pinky around his, and I took my little brother trick or treating, like I'd done every year since he first returned. This wasn't our neighborhood anymore. Sure, the names of the streets were the same, but that was about it. The yuppie influx, with the ensuing rent increases and property tax hikes, had squashed out most of the old guard. The newbies didn't care for the sturdy, century-old houses forged with brick and mortar. One by one, those stout homes were being flattened to make way for flimsier, but more stylish facades. Soon, our childhood home was going to suffer the same fate. Jimmy must have sensed that something was amiss because he tightened his pinky around mine. Though I haven't heard his voice since that night by the river, his pinky squeeze said enough. It said, I've got you. That was our private show of reassurance that helped sustain us through our childhood. When mom wept at the dinner table as we split a dried hunk of welfare cheese for dinner, I'd give Jimmy a squeeze. When dad staggered home drunk and started laying into mom, I'd join Jimmy on his small twin mattress. We'd squeeze pinkies, eyes shut tight, with pillows over our ears so we wouldn't have to hear dad's fist knocking against mom's head. I've got you. Tonight, we stopped at every house that still had its lights on. Our new neighbors smiled awkwardly, genuinely troubled by the sight of the neighborhood drunk escorting a child in a raggedy ghost costume. I didn't give a shit what they thought as long as they tossed a few bite-sized Snickers bars into Jimmy's bucket. Soon, the streets began to empty and the trick-or-treaters went home. One by one, those grinning jack-o'-lanterns went dark, those orange window lights dimmed, and it was just Jimmy and I wandering the lonely streets. We headed back toward the house. This was where we would normally part ways, with Jimmy heading back on his own. Tonight, though, I remained at his side. He cocked his head again, curious. I squeezed his pinky. Though I loved Jimmy, he was still my little brother and, often, I treated him as such. Just because I hated the neighborhood bullies didn't mean I didn't lean some pointers from their abuse. Sometimes, I'd slap Jimmy around or steal his toys because he'd annoyed me somehow. Other times, I just wanted to feel stronger than someone else. The day of his death, Jimmy had put me in a particularly foul mood. Using the five-fingered discount, I'd gotten comic books from the drugstore on York Street and I was looking forward to thumbing through them. Jimmy came rushing into our bedroom crying because the rats had gotten to his hand-me-down Jason Voorhees costume. The critters had gnawed through the plastic hockey mask and left the, fake, blood splattered overalls stinking like rat turds. I told him to take it up with mom and dad, but he said mom was passed out and dad was at the bar, as usual. My mood instantly turned black, not necessarily because of Jimmy, but because, once again, I'd have to pick up the slack for our parents. I cooked most of Jimmy's meals. I scrubbed the stink off his clothes and got him ready for school every morning while mom and dad were off, drunk and doped. All I'd wanted was a night to myself, curled up in bed with some stolen comic books, but they couldn't stay sober long enough to even give me that much. Somehow, I kept my temper in check. I got him to stop sobbing by yanking the sheet off his bed, cutting out those mismatched eye holes, and draping it over him. There, I said. You're a ghost now. His green eyes were visible through the holes in the sheet. His cheeks perked up under the sheet and I could tell he was smiling. Can you take me trick or treating? He asked. No, I didn't want to, but I also didn't want him crying again and mom would have beaten the shit out of me if I let Jimmy wander the neighborhood alone. So we set out into the streets, amongst a legion of Ninja Turtles and Ghostbusters and Barbie dolls brought to life. Though it was simple, he enjoyed his makeshift costume. I was just hoping to get through the night without bumping into our enemies. That was certainly naive of me. It didn't take long for them to zero in on us. There were four of them, all older boys. Even the smallest one towered over me. They were wearing clown masks, thin plastic smiling red-nosed clowns that filled my stomach with dread. None of the parents milling about with their kids noticed the brewing confrontation, not with the dozens of trick-or-treaters clogging the sidewalk. Jimmy clutched his candy bucket to his chest. One of the bullies reached for it, and that was when I snapped. I couldn't help it. I might have been pissed off at him for dragging me out here, but this was Jimmy's favorite night of the year. I couldn't watch some assholes ruin it for him. I swung, hard. My fist connected with the bully's face and I heard a loud crunch right before blood trickled down from behind the clown's visage. 
I grabbed Jimmy by the wrist and we took off into the throngs of costumed kids. We rounded the next corner and disappeared into an alley. We hid there, holding our breath as the bullies sped past. There was no way they were going to let this go. Two of them would likely roam the neighborhood looking for us, while the other two would lay in wait near our house. What are we going to do? Jimmy asked, voice quivering in fear. Every night, right before I black out, I think about how I should have just squeezed his pinky. But I didn't. Instead, I blamed him. We wouldn't have been in this trouble if he hadn't been such a crybaby back home. That was why, of the dozens of places we could have gone to hide, I chose the river, because I knew he was terrified of the river. Today, the Delaware Riverfront was as gentrified as the rest of the neighborhood. A casino and towering condominiums loomed large and quaint pedestrian walkways were infested with pop-up beer gardens. In our youth, the riverfront had been an industrial graveyard, dominated by long shuttered factories with stretches of wilderness between them. Stinking sumac trees swayed overhead and plump river rats started through the bushes. This wasn't the first time we had to hide back here. Jimmy always hated it. Although the neighborhood lay only a quarter mile to the west, Jimmy thought the riverfront was too isolated. He feared that if our bullies ever caught us here, they could kill us and no one would ever know. My mood hadn't improved when we finally reached one of the piers, big gray concrete blocks jutting out 50 feet into the sloshing water, supported by a number of wood pilings underneath. Jimmy remained a few feet behind me, still in his costume, nervously gripping his Halloween bucket. The tide was coming in and he jumped every time he felt a wave hit the pilings beneath us, as if the pier might collapse. But what scared Jimmy the most was the possibility of falling into the water, that those rough green-brown waves might trap him under the pier, where he'd come up for air and smash his face against unyielding concrete instead. Can we just please try to go home? He whined. No, I snapped back. Not unless you want those assholes to knock your teeth out. He lowered his head. But I don't like it back here. Looking at my whimpering little brother, I lost all sense of empathy. After running scared from our bullies, I was eager to assert myself as an alpha. I yanked him toward the edge of the pier. I'm so tired of you acting like a wimp, I snarled. I shoved him closer to the edge, where the water sloshed violently ten feet below us. There's nothing to be afraid of back here. I just want to go home, he cried, the eye holes in the sheet now rimmed with tears. Stop being such a pussy. I shouted then instinctively gave him a stiff ride hook to the shoulder. What happened next occurred within seconds, yet in my memory, it seems to play out for an eternity. I'd hit him harder than I meant to. Jimmy dropped his candy bucket then staggered as his shoes got caught in the pool of fabric underfoot. I watched in muted disbelief as he flopped over the pier, arms waving, right before the back of his head cracked against the concrete edge. There was a splash ten feet beneath me and my brother was gone leaving behind nothing more than a red patch on the concrete and white bubbles breaking the water's surface. Pinky's locked, we maneuvered through condominium parking lots and empty beer garden stalls until we reached that old pier. For a moment, my memories blended with the present and I saw myself, cold and shivering and soaked with river water, trudging back toward the neighborhood alone, clutching Jimmy's candy bucket. I remembered how cold and dark the river was when I dove in, fighting the waves, trying in vain to find my brother before finally giving up. I never told anyone what happened. That night, when I got home, mom was still passed out and dad hadn't come back from the bar yet. I hid my wet clothes then, later, told them that Jimmy had simply run away from me. I was terrified of what would happen if they knew the truth. There was a police search that amounted to nothing. Dad didn't seem to care very much. Months later, mom swallowed 40 sleeping pills and never woke up. I took to stealing swigs of dad's half-empty liquor bottles to soothe my guilt a habit that had served me ever since. But even that relief has proved fleeting. As Jimmy and I walked along the pier, I tightened my pinky around his, content to die sober. We stood at the edge of the pier. Though I couldn't see his face, I could tell that he was no less afraid of the river now than he had been 25 years ago. Jimmy stepped off the pier and disappeared into the water below. I wondered, once this pier was inevitably torn asunder to make way for a condo or another casino, would Jimmy still resurface on Halloween? If he did, and he ventured into the neighborhood, would he even recognize that the shiny new studio apartments were standing on the grave of our old house? Either way, I was going to make sure that he didn't go through it alone. I stepped off the pier, just like Jimmy had that night. I cracked the base of my skull against that concrete lip. A lightning flash of pain shot across the world and I crashed hard into the water, pushed at once by the tide onto the pier. A wave slammed me against one of the pilings and I felt something snap in my backhand. When I tried to scream, 
filthy river water filled my mouth. Yet, as I was thrashed about under the dock, my consciousness slowly fading, I felt Jimmy's tiny pinky finger squeezing around my own. I've got you. That happened almost one year ago, last Halloween. Though I wanted nothing more than to slip into a watery slumber with my little brother, he must have felt otherwise. I woke up, weeks later, in a hospital. They removed patches of my skull to relieve the pressure from the brain bleed, courtesy of cracking my head on that concrete lip. My ribs had been shattered to splinters from the paramedic's vigorous chest compressions. They found me on the road, which meant Jimmy dragged me from the water, across the industrial wilderness, then out to the waiting blacktop. I asked the medics if there'd been a boy in a ratty ghost costume with me when they arrived. They said they hadn't seen one. Anyway, I'm writing this on the computer at the public library right off Gerard Avenue, but I better finish up. The librarian is a real asshole. Doesn't like it when street bums like me stink up the joint. It's almost Halloween once again. Jimmy might not want me down in the water with him, but I'm going back to join him, regardless. I've got his candy bucket, so we can hit the neighborhood one last time. I've also got a box cutter with the sharpest goddamn razors I could find. Once Jimmy slips back into the water, I'm going to open myself up, both wrists, then my carotid artery, and I'm jumping into the green blue Delaware shit water right along with him, because I'm Jimmy's big brother, god damn it. I won't let him swim alone.